This is the tale of six young men who mysteriously disappeared one fateful night, leaving no trace behind. To this day, their whereabouts remain a mystery, and their families have encountered numerous obstacles in their quest for answers. These young men have been dubbed the Lost Boys due to their enigmatic vanishing act, and despite the passage of time, we are no closer to unraveling the mystery surrounding their disappearance. The names of these young men are Jay Boyle, Michael Cummins, Daniel Higgins, Chad Smith, Robbie Rumbolt, and Jamie Lefebvre, all of whom were in their late teens, aged between 17 and 18 at the time. During their spring break, these young friends indulged in the usual activities associated with teenagers, drinking, smoking, and partying. However, on one fateful night, they decided to embark on a more adventurous journey. Their final confirmed sighting was as they strolled together toward the East Shore Marina in Pickering, Ontario, during the early hours of March 17, 1995. Video surveillance captured the actions of three of the young men, namely Michael, Jamie, and Robbie, as they broke into a marina on Frenchman's Bay around 1.48 a.m. In one of the videos, they were seen taking beer from one of the docked boats. This video footage marked the last known visual contact with the group. The following morning, these boys failed to return home, didn't reach out to their friends or families, and, understandably, their concerned girlfriends decided to contact the police to report them as missing. Initially, the authorities didn't treat these missing reports with great urgency, as these were six young men who had last been seen enjoying a night of partying together. It was assumed they might have stayed over somewhere, got into some mischief, and continued their revelry elsewhere. However, after two days had passed with no sign of the young men, the police decided it was time to launch a thorough investigation into their disappearance. Almost 36 hours after their last known appearance, a massive search effort was initiated. After receiving reports of the boys' disappearance, the police headed to the marina to investigate and speak with individuals who stored their boats there. Residents at the marina mentioned that during the early morning hours on the date in question, between 2.30 and 3 a.m., they had heard the sound of a motorboat out on the lake. Subsequently, the following morning, two boats were reported stolen from different marinas. These boats included a 14-foot imitation Boston Whaler motorboat and a unique three-wheeled paddle boat, essentially a floating tricycle. This information led the police to suspect that the stolen boats may have capsized and the young men were possibly without life jackets. Considering the cold March weather in Canada, the frigid water would quickly induce hypothermia, rendering them unable to swim to safety within minutes. The search efforts were extensive, involving the Durham, Ontario Police, the Toronto Police Marine Unit, the Coast Guard, a Hercules C-130 aircraft, and a helicopter from the Air Sea Rescue Unit at Canadian Forces Base Trenton. Thousands of volunteers from southern Ontario also joined in the search. Unfortunately, no signs of the boys or the missing boats were discovered, not even a trace of clothing. The only item recovered from the lake was a gas can believed to belong to the 14-foot Boston Whaler. The fact that the weather on the lake that night was reportedly fairly calm adds to the mystery surrounding the disappearance of the six boys. Given their experience with boating and familiarity with the water, it's indeed perplexing that all six of them would have capsized simultaneously, as suggested by the police. Even though both the boats and the bodies of the boys were never recovered, the prevailing theory remains that they may have met this tragic fate. The absence of any video footage showing the boys departing on the boats, coupled with the fact that neither the boys nor the boats were ever found, prevents this theory from being confirmed as an absolute truth. However, it stands as the most plausible sequence of events based on the available information. On April 10, 1998, a little over three years after the boys went missing, two sets of human remains were discovered in the Niagara River. One of these sets consisted of bone fragments, while the second set still had some clothing intact. The initial police report on the clothing indicated that it included a pair of red Levi denim jeans with a waist size of 32 and an inseam of 31. Additionally, there was a brown belt, a black wallet, and white socks found with these remains. The discovery of the clothing and human remains raised hopes for Jay Boyle's family, as Jay had been wearing a pair of red Levi denim jeans on the day he disappeared. Furthermore, his sister believed that the belt found resembled one Jay had owned. In their pursuit of finding answers, Jay Boyle's family requested that the police investigate these remains, suspecting they might belong to their missing son. 
However, to their dismay, the Durham police declined to conduct the investigation, citing high costs. In an effort to move forward, Jay's family even offered to cover the expenses themselves. They were genuinely hopeful that these remains could provide information about their loved one's fate. They enlisted the assistance of a private detective to aid in their quest and initiated a request for access to the documentation related to the remains. However, it appears that there were complications and disputes between various law enforcement agencies involved in the case. These issues revolved around determining which agency had custody of the remains and what file number should be used to request access to them creating a frustrating situation filled with bureaucratic hurdles and delays. The family's quest to access the remains was marred by numerous challenges, including extensive redactions in the reports, especially in the notes and the omission of many names. When they finally managed to obtain access to the remains and had them sent to the coroner for analysis, they received disappointing news. The evidence was deemed insufficient to construct a DNA profile, and it was discovered that the pants originally believed to be red Levi denim jeans were, in fact, lightweight pants of an orange color. Adding to the frustration, the private investigator was not allowed to examine the pants, and it was revealed that the police had misplaced the remains for a period, further delaying the process. The family persisted and pressured the coroner's office to create a DNA profile. After initial reluctance, they eventually complied. The obtained DNA profile was then compared to DNA provided by Jay's mother, which came from his umbilical cord. However, the results yielded a disappointing outcome as the coroner stated that it did not match Jay's DNA. This must have been a deeply disheartening moment for the family after their hopes had been raised. It's unfortunate that a crucial piece of evidence, the video footage of the three boys entering the marina, was lost due to an error by the police. Family members had the opportunity to view this footage in 1995, and they positively identified the teens in the video as Jamie, Robbie, and Michael, and no one else. Strangely, when the families asked to review the tape again, the police informed them that they no longer had it. This raised concerns among the families. When the private investigator attempted to access the video, they were told that it simply didn't exist, despite the fact that the families distinctly remembered watching it and identifying three of the boys in the footage. The disappearance of this footage remains a perplexing and frustrating aspect of the case. Siobhan Boyle, Jay's mom, summed up the frustration by saying, How do you say something's not there that the moms have seen, that all the families have seen? Information obtained through Freedom of Information documents revealed some potential sightings of the boys after their disappearance. Some reports placed them in Kew Beach in Toronto near Jamie's home a few days following their disappearance. However, there were conflicting witness accounts, with one person claiming to have seen Jamie in a Burger King near Clarence, New York on March 19th, and another asserting that they spotted Chad at his home on March 17th. These various sightings and discrepancies only added to the complexity of the case. The family's commitment to keeping the memory of the boys alive is truly heartwarming. Each year on March 17th, they gather at Frenchman's Bay to remember the young men and honor their memory. For anyone who may have information related to this case or wishes to provide tips, you can reach out to the authorities by calling 905-579-1520 or contact Durham Regional Crime Stoppers anonymously at 1-800-222-TIPS or visit their website at www.durhamregionalcrimestoppers.ca. Additionally, information can be shared with the family's private investigator, Bruce Ricketts, at lostboys.tipline at gmail.com. Your cooperation and assistance in shedding light on this case are greatly appreciated by the families who continue to seek answers and closure. The fate of Jay Boyle, Michael Cummins, Daniel Higgins, Chad Smith, Robbie Rumbolt, and Jamie Lefebvre remains shrouded in uncertainty. The hope remains that one day, someone with information that can help solve this enduring mystery will come forward. Thank you for joining us for another episode of Fireside Unsolved. If you haven't already, please like and subscribe to help the channel grow. Until next time, take it easy and be easy, you filthy bastards.